Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Airspeed's Cora rewatch video. This one's going to be for K303, The Earth Queen. And I think this is one of the, the weaker episodes of the book. Um, primarily because this subplot here with these two episodes, with The Earth Queen, end up, I think, not meaning as much come the end, to the point where I think time over especially this episode would have been better used elsewhere because my fundamental criticism with book three is the very very weak uh, characterization of the book three villains so why do you basically devote two whole episodes to characterizing the earth queen who you're only characterizing to in a way justify the villain's motivations later on that she is a tyrannical queen this goes with the idea that the Red Lotus don't like world leaders and we spent two episodes to get across that she is a bad world leader. It's it's an example of just they tell us things about the Red Lotus but they show us the Earth Queen and I think that should have been backwards. You don't need to spend this much time characterizing the Earth Queen given your overall idea for her whereas you needed to really give time and attention to the Red Lotus characters who are actually, you know, by the end, you know, even though obviously they kill off three of them, but you needed to characterize them before that. And it, it to me, just isn't worth, you know, a two-parter. I like episode four. I, I think it's episode three where the, the weakness is, um, in that they, this isn't like a terrible plot or anything like that. It's just, <clears throat> this initial one, the Earth Queen just isn't a particularly, I think, strong or interesting character. They are purposefully over the top, borderline comical with her in her presentation of just, she's picky, but there's also some actual bad things that she's doing. And that <clears throat> that combined with um, just little things like, okay, we have a new leader in the Earth Kingdom now. Like We're, we're not used to this character. Um, has Quay done anything? What's really going on here? And we see that, no, Bossing Say for the most part is very similar. We've still got the different kind of rings of the city. The lower ring is still very poor. Um, and for the most part, it doesn't seem like it's particularly technologically advanced. We see that the Dai Li are back for some reason. And I think that's another thing that needed an explanation of just like, last time we saw them in Avatar, they were banished by Azula. So where did they go? Like. Did they just do their own thing? Did they come back? Would Quay even let the Dai Li be a thing? Or did she uh, bring this back into play um, like as soon as like uh, she took over? Um, it, it's just something that needed any sort of explanation, I think, for <clears throat> people who remember what happened in uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Just the Dai Li do need a bit of an explanation. I get you could sort of be just like, okay, like she's a bad Earth Queen, she wanted the Dai Li, but say that, ex explain that. Don't just have them be there as if like, oh yeah, they've always been a part of Bossing Say, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, just the fact that we don't even know if Quay like brought in a new group that was not corrupt and then she corrupted them again. Um, I think the benefit to this plot is that you have Kai go in a good arc because obviously in the upper ring of the city he has a lot of people to steal from and it allows Mako and Bolin to be separated from everyone and actually meet their their family. I think that's the absolute best part of this episode. It's the real kind of emotional core that's going on here and I think in a way for both brothers is their real focus within this book. It's them being involved in fights and kind of getting across how strong they are but their characterization is definitely the fact that they've met their family now and they kind of understand things a little bit more that their family had just as hard time of it as uh, they did but having to like reveal to them the um the fact that you know yin's son is dead their mother's dead that they will never meet them and that the boys grew up in a very you know, bad situation. It's it's heartwarming, but it's also kind of tragic at the same time. And I think they play it really well in that initial introduction scene, and just uh, just the, the the emotion you can see on the faces of everyone as the brothers like 
hate the fact that they have to reveal this, but they know they, they have to say it. But then, you know, the, the, the family begins to just focus on the fact that, like, okay, they're gone, but we have these two now. They're part of our family as well. And the fact that they know of both of them from, like, Pro Bending, they you know Bolin from the, the, the Nook Took stuff, it's good continuity as well, that even in the lower ring of the city, they would kind of be aware of this stuff. So, um... I think that all works together quite nicely, but just the idea that because they were so poor, they had no way to like communicate or reach out, and it's it it speaks of this kind of deeper thing of like they explain their father Son and kind of why he left Bossing Say and that he wanted to make more of himself than just living in the lower ring of the city, and as far as we we're aware, he did. It was just this kind of tragic event where they were killed, um, and. That's, uh, that's, I think, what works so well here, especially the, the scene with Mako and Yin and Mako giving the scarf over as, like, the one thing he has left from his father, but kind of understanding that it's it's more important to give, kind of, her the last thing that she remembers from her son. Um, so, I, 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 th I thought that was a, a solid scene, a, a nice kind of symbolic gesture to do, even though you are kind of taking out, like, a key kind of visual kind of trait of a main character, um, it, it, it's a very fitting scene to do for him as well. And just through them, you get the reveal, I suppose, at the end, that one of the actual bad things that the Earth Queen is doing is that she is rounding up the new airbenders in Bossing Say and is forming them into uh, her own personal kind of airbending army who are being trained and, I suppose, brainwashed a bit as well by the Dai Li. Um, it's a cool reveal. I think it's a little... At, at times it feels a little bit too much like they were purposefully trying to recapture the feel from the City of Walls and Secrets, that kind of uh, political arc from the middle of Avatar. And um, when Korra is its own thing, it doesn't need to do stuff this way. This is why I think the Dai Li thing is a little bit of a, like... I wish, I wish there was a bit of ex more explanation, because otherwise it just feels like... Oh, any sort of conspiracy stuff going on, it has to involve the Dai Li. Whereas, I almost feel it, it kind of would have worked a little bit better if we kind of got a little bit of a history lesson that the Dai Li, like, never reformed. But, like, the new Earth Queen's, like, personal guards who are similar in power to the Dai Li, they are the ones doing this. Um, so, I think there's just an element of that where, like, th it's, it's a cool thing, it's a cool reference. But because it's unexplained, it just sort of feels a little bit weak. Um, <clears throat> we get a, a, a small subplot of just, like, obviously Korra meets the Earth Queen and doesn't like her all that much. Um, and, of course, the, the, the reveal that she's sort of keeping the airbenders away from her is meant to be uh, important. But more of the, the major issues between Korra and the Earth Queen come out in the next episode. And it's, it's probably the one time in, like, the, these two episodes, really, where we really start to, like, get that really addressed. The idea that like Korra actually has these bad relationships with the world leaders and um, and and I and I think it's 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 kind of the resolution on this is that because of the type of character that Korra is, they can never have her justify the actions of the Red Lotus because their ideals are fundamentally so extreme that Korra struggles to even gain any sort of a lesson out of what's going on here. That's that, that's kind of like the point that we're I suppose getting at here where like it's so different the Red Lotus ideology in terms of like wanting to kill the world leaders and put the world into chaos than like Unalak who wanted the world to be more spiritual but did it by forcing everyone to be spiritual. Like there's a clear cut difference between like a positive ideology which Korra eventually tries to bring in with keeping the spirit portals open versus the craziness of Unalak's end idea. But here it's kind of like you want to kill the world leaders and basically have a place where there is no world leaders and just chaos. Put some, basically put the world into a situation where it's used to structure, take all of that away and just expect everything to be okay. It's just, I think with Korra, it's so difficult to get behind that. And as much as they try and bring it together, it's like it's her learning about like, you know, freedom and like the, the corruption of world leaders. It's like, yes, but she's not going to attempt to do it in any sort of a way like that. And um, so 
that's where like this arc as well struggles in that like okay you're characterizing a character you're about to kill off but you're also setting up this relationship with Korra and the Earth Queen that is ultimately going to go nowhere because Korra is going to hear what Zaheer has to say in episode 9 and just immediately be like I don't like the Earth Queen but I'm not going to go that far and that's that's basically the result of like the the setup with the world leaders. She doesn't like Raiko, but she's not going to justify his being killed or anything like that. And it's to the point where like she doesn't really actively try to like make it so that he's not the leader anymore. She just kind of stays away from that stuff. So it feels like Korra is just so far separated from the villains outside of the fact that they want to capture her, which we'll get to. Um that the main plot really is lacking in stakes until right at the end. And if they didn't go overboard with the fighting throughout most of this book, the Red Lotus, I don't think, would really have a lot of substance to them. They, I think, are got across because they present them so strongly in fights, the amount of strong characters they end up, like, defeating, taking out, killing in some cases. And that's what really gets them across. And their ideology is just kind of like sounds kind of cool sounds similar in terms of like being able to get on board like the other ones but i think when you really look into it it is the most like over the top one that we have um but yeah getting back into what this episode is actually about we get a brief like cora and a sammy moment where like it's 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 not really like developing their relationship like at all they're just in the scene together it's basically Korra had to go here, so someone had to drive her, like, fly the airship there, so that was Asami, and then Asami's also involved in the fight. There's no real character from Asami in this scene, and because she doesn't have, like, a plot of her own, this book, um, there's, there's definitely a sense of just, we have nowhere for Asami this book, so let's just put her next to Korra anytime we can and develop their friendship, which is okay? But I think one of the big things that ends up uh, really affecting the Korasami relationship uh, come the end is just that I don't feel like we get to know Asami all that well because there's just so much time like throughout most of book two, uh, most of book uh, three here, where okay her friendship with Korra is being established but her character on her own isn't. And it's, it's something that like going through it right now like how many times have I actually talked about, like, Asami in a notable way? And it's been, like, episode 7, episode 12 from book 1. And then maybe, like, the first episode of, like, book 2. Because everything else is just the romance stuff, which ends up being obviously so kind of badly written that it never really develops anyone's character all that much. It just creates a drama, as I've talked about a lot. Um, so it just, um, it feels like Asami just, they really, in the middle of these books, lost track of what they wanted to do. And then they just set, decided to commit to core Asami without, I think, really considering the fact that, like, she's not characterized all that well. And, and part of the issue that a lot of people took with it was not that they had an issue with the relationship happening full stop. It's more of that, you know... I don't feel like we even got to know Sammy all that well. And just there's so much distractions around the character that she never really gets a chance to kind of shine on her own. Um, but uh, w that, that'll that be something to watch out for as we go through the remaining episodes in the in the series. Um, but yeah, I, like there's there's really like, it, when you really break it down, there's not all that much like to this episode. Um, uh, I suppose Kai... Um, Obviously, he's not in it too much, but just establishing that he's continuing with his idea of... He really doesn't care about the people with him. He's just looking for a way to basically live the life he wants to live, which is kind of selfishly stealing what he wants and basically living the life of luxury by stealing and never getting caught. Um, and it's, I suppose, right at the end, we see the, the first flaw come into play of, like, when he is captured, there's no one to really help him. And because he basically got Mako and Bolin into trouble here, even though it sort of led them to their family, like, should they even help him coming up next? And the fact that they do shows this sort of, like, 
selflessness that they care about someone even if they're not getting anything back and it sort of teaches him that lesson to kind of smooth him out as a character because otherwise you see that he's he's sort of getting on well with everyone he's he's he has he likes being training with Janora with the airbending that we get a little bit of a hint of he kind of takes Boomy out quite quickly in that fight he's using the airbending well in the little kind of chase scene against uh, Mako and Bolin so he's very skilled and as we'll see in the next episode he is one of the most skilled of the new airbenders that we have left because he's had that bit of training and just I think is meant to be a little bit of a kind of like prodigy at it not and maybe not that level but he's meant to be very good at it so and um, I think it's the setup for a strong character arc for the next episode where they actually I think do most of that and then when they do use Kai in the rest of this book it's, it's really really well done and um, but uh, anything else? Oh, uh, we, we do get uh, some setup with. Um, we don't see Pali getting rescued in this episode, but we get the setup for it. We see Zuko with Tonrock heading to the Northern Water Tribe, meeting with Eska and Desna, who are obviously the new chiefs. And Zuko has to inform them that, yeah, there's a prisoner held in a secret prison here that you guys don't even know about. Some fun interactions, I think Zuko interacting with Eska and Desna is actually really, really funny because he ends up kind of explaining to them, okay, Pali has combustion bending. Side note, uh, I hired someone with combustion bending once to kill the Avatar. And it's just this moment of silence when, like, Zuko, who, like, for the past, like, 50-something years of his life has, has been, like, a kind of hero-type character, but in his early years, obviously, like, he was trying to capture Aang, we all know... And just es uh, es Eska kind of interrupting, like, I get that, you know. When Korra ruined my wedding, I tried to, like, kill her as well. And Tonrock's just like, who am I in this kind of elevator with? Um, so I thought that was a, a really fun little dynamic um, between all of them. And as well as that, like, we're, we're seeing a lot of world, world leaders here. That here's the leader of the North, the leaders of the, the, leaders of the North, the leader of the South. Uh, Zuko, obviously, obviously his... his uh, daughter is the fire lord now but you know former world leader who still has a you know somewhat important role kind of he's like an ambassador um, and because he's like i suppose i were meant to interpret him as like the leader of the white lotus they seem to like go under his command and he's able to just meet like decide what he wants to do with the prisons so i obviously i think we're meant to interpret him as the leader of the the white lotus for the most part and um, that's very unclear. As I said, the 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 Red Lotus White Lotus conflict. Outside of them explaining what the Red Lotus is and where it came from, in episode nine, it's just dropped. It's basically just a drop plot point that the, the White Lotus are even a thing um, here. And I think it's 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 very signified by the fact that they don't even tell you like if Zuko is or is not the leader. Um, because like it's it's never really established like if he is like technically even a member of the organization, we assume he is, and it makes logical sense to assume that. Um, in that I'd be shocked if he wasn't. But the fact that they never say it speaks to I suppose the treatment of the White Lotus in this series, uh, and just the writers. I think really misinterpreting like what needed to be told, what didn't need to be told, as we've, we've talked about a lot already. Um, the actual stuff with the Earth Queen, I suppose I, I sort of glanced past nearly all, most of it. It's it's just establishing a few character traits about her, that she is very demanding. She doesn't like animals, which is meant to be a contrast to the fact that, like, Quay had a pet bear, liked animals, and she's in fact allergic to them. Uh, it's just like, okay, fine. Um, it's... I, I wish there was more kind of to her as a character or else that given that she isn't particularly interesting they didn't spend as much time on this on what's going on here as a focus like I get it structure wise that they sort of need to have all of this happen because they have to be in Bossing say for Malcolm and Bolin to meet their family for Kai to go through his arc for all of the captured by the Earth King Earth Queen airbenders to then join up with Tenzin to become the core of the new Air Nomads going forward. That, like, plot-wise has to happen. I think it's character focus 
focusing so much on the Earth Queen when they don't really get much resolution out of it isn't the best. Like, I get it, they have her come back later on and she kind of captures Korra, which is the, the episode that obviously leads up to her death. Um, it's just it's just a case, like, with most of the main plots in Book 3, where, like, airbenders are the focus, and then suddenly, like, we're not focused on that anymore. Earth Queen's the focus, okay, we're not focused on that. And then, like, okay, airbenders are going to come back here, then the Earth Queen's going to come back here, then we're going to kill off the Earth Queen, so that, that's gone. And then we'll come back to the airbenders right at the end because the here kind of incorporates them back in. And it's just kind of like, uh, okay, now the, the Red Lotus are just kind of like here and there about with what they're doing. Um, in that, uh, noticeably, they're not in this episode outside of, I suppose, us getting to sort of meet Pali here. Um, and that's really it. So um, it's it's unfortunate because I think... These early episodes, especially once they free Pali and the group is sort of back together, I feel like you sort of had your opportunity at that point to characterize them better, go into backstory if you needed to with them, uh, like maybe as they're talking about their past, now that they're reunited, all four of them together for the first time, you have maybe some of the characters explaining to Korra, like what they know of their history and like the, the, the kidnapping attempt and stuff like that. There, there I think is time because as we'll get to in a couple of episodes, they really have some kind of needless Red Lotus fighting scenes that serve no, no purpose that, you know, just a couple of scenes of them talking would have got it across so much better. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's more or less everything I want to talk about here. Um, there was one nice Janora Kai moment uh, that was okay. The scene with the outlaws, I, I roughly talked about it. Um, it. I suppose what they say to her at the end more or less gives Korra a hint that, okay, taxes, sure, but this is just a queen more or less stealing money from her people, getting across <coughs> how uh, poor of a leader she is once again. But uh, that's, I think, most of what there is. And... I think because of that, it's just an episode I feel that there's not really a lot to talk about. Because, I should I spend more time talking about the Earth Queen? I, I don't really think so, because it, it, it by the end really feels like she's just built up here to be the, the character you can sort of accept being killed. Because they were so kind of comically tyrannical. Whereas like any of the other world leaders or Korra you would sort of feel like, whoa, that was a bit harsh. Like, even Raiko, just because, like, there's been some element of seriousness, even though he's been, <clears throat> I think, obviously, like, making some of the worst decisions in the series. If they killed off Raiko here, like, I think that would have an insane impact, much, much more than if they killed off the Earth Queen. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that stuff in the Red Lotus's plan um, as it obviously comes to light. But, um, yeah, that, that's my thoughts on this episode. Uh, shorter review than usual and um, I just you know th th there's good aspects to this episode but it's um I think for the most part self-explanatory e e even the um Mako Bolin scene it's excellent but it's like it's 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 a kind of simple reunion scene that just has to play a little bit of, upon histories explain a little bit about their father and they just they do that I think perfectly no complaints about those scenes really whatsoever they use that to incorporate the some of the characters learning about the Earth Queen's plan, uh, why people are being kidnapped by the Dai Li and so on. But uh, yeah, that's that's all there is to say about this one. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts are on the episode. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.